My friends, I'm so excited that you are hanging out with me today. Some of you, maybe I've met. Some of you, maybe I have not. But I'm so pumped that you are kicking it. My name is James Robolata, and I'm pumped to be here and kicking it with you during the hot mess that is 2020. But my friends, emphasis on the hot because we got to stay cute in these streets. Let's go now. Come on now. Come on now. Uh, I'm super pumped to be here. My, uh, I, think, I think a natural place to start, a natural place to start is to tell you how I eat pancakes. That makes sense, right? Okay, cool. Great. Leadership 2020 pancakes through line. You see it. Here's how I eat pancakes, friends. Okay, first off, you can get out of my face with a short stack of pancakes, all right? I know you can't quite tell me, okay, but like I'm a, I'm a grown-ass man, all right? I'm a big man. I'm going to eat three pancakes, okay? No short stacks over here. And when it comes to my pancakes, I'm an equal opportunist. Same amount of butter and syrup on each one, okay? I'm not like the Bisquick box. Y'all seen the Bisquick box before? It's got the big stack of pancakes on it, the little yellow pad of butter up top on the syrup just delicately dripping down the sides. Mmm, what? Yeah, what? <laughs> no. No, because if you eat your pancakes that way, you're cutting into a drier gradient of pancake. And see, that just doesn't make a lot of sense. See, I like my pancakes uh, adequately and equally soaked with butter and syrup. If you like your pancakes soaked with butter and syrup, do me a favor. Raise your hand. Smash an emoji. Tell me how you feel about it. There we go. We got some people out here. I see you, Jessica. All right, Alyssa. I got you out here. Maggie, Kiera, of course, go Bucks. So the thing is, <laughs> my friends. <laughs> the thing is, is that if you don't like your pancakes soaked with butter and syrup, that's okay. Maybe we got some dippers in the house, okay? Maybe we have some gluten intolerant individuals, in which case it's okay. This is an inclusive environment. Thank you so much for being here. But after I get my pancakes adequately soaked with butter and syrup, what I do is I cut little triangles out all the way around so that I have a star. Then I cut the points off the star so I have another circle. And then I cut more triangles out. It's a very geometric eating experience. And I start that way because I need you all to know from the jump, I'm a little bit weird. I'm a little bit weird, but it's okay. I think we're all a little bit weird. I mean, sure, maybe we choose not to get up in front of a few hundred randos and share our weirds, but uh, alas... <laughs> We all got something, friends. And it's fun when we share our weirds. Because I want you to think about what connects us. I want you to think about what connects us even in 2020. The things that connect us are not the mission statements of our organizations. They are not the uh, the mission statements of our universities. <laughs> yes, of course, the mission statement of our institutions that was written by a bunch of old white dudes that like to say words like finance and research. No, my friends, those aren't the things that connect us. What connects us, what connects us to our stories are these little random things. Think about it. When you first showed up to your college campus, you didn't know anybody. Maybe you knew a couple people from high school, but you like wish they didn't go to the same school. You're like, didn't you apply somewhere else too? But, but still, you were there. And, uh, and, and, and so... And you're like, I don't really know what's going on. This is an overwhelming environment. I don't know a lot of people. What's it going to be like? I have no idea. Is anybody going to like me? Are people going to make fun of my sheets, right? Until we met that one other individual that kind of had something weird like us. And we're like, oh, shoot. You're weird like me. Maybe I'm going to be all right. So my friends, right now I feel a little weird. Right now I feel a little alone. So I'm wondering if any of you have any unique food quirks. Do any of you ever mash two random ingredients together and your friends are like, what are you actually doing right now? If so, can you tell me in the chat, what are your two random food pairings that you love to put together that your friends judge you for? I know we got somebody on this call who does pickles and peanut butter sandwiches. I know we got you out here. There we go. First one. Literally the first one. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, I love this. Ketchup on raw carrots. Haley, now we're really getting into it. Now we're just out of condiments in the refrigerator, Haley. That's where we're at. Oreos and peanut butter, I would eat the crap out of that. Chocolate pudding and Cheez-Its, I would judge the crap out of that. Um, <laughs> I love this. Uh, buffalo and pesto pizza. I'm intrigued, but I'm also Italian and from New York, so I don't know how I feel about it. 
Uh, I love this. Dipping French fries into milkshakes. Can we all just agree that that's the reason Wendy's is still alive today, is the fact that people have learned that French fries just go great in Frosties. Now, this program is sponsored by Wendy's, actually. That's a lie. I have no sponsors. Uh, <laughs> broccoli and pizza? Oh, no, Ebony. Oh, no, friend. Pork roll? Wow, Jersey, you're out here. Not Taylor Ham, Maya? Not Taylor Ham? That's right. I'll start a fight. So uh, the thing is, my friends, is that we all have a weird. And it's fun when we connect. And maybe you're sitting there like, James, I don't know if I have a food quirk, but I guarantee you do something else weird, okay? Some of y'all like stick your finger in your belly button and smell, okay? I don't know what you do, all right? I don't know what you do, but we all have a weird, and it's fun when we start that way. Because it's our weirds that connects us. It's our weirds that remind us of humanity. And leadership is often a thing of deadlines, is often a thing of obligations, of getting events done, of meeting things, of moving needles. And we forget about the humanity of the individuals around us because we get caught up in everything else. Many of us are over-involved with a whole bunch of other things. And so we're like, we need this meeting to go a little bit quicker. Or we're in the middle of binge watching something and we paused it to come back to a meeting. And now we got to get back to the binge watching because we're all addicted at this point. But whatever it is, we forget about the humanity of leadership. We forget about the humanity of the humans in our organizations, that they have other things going on. And when we forget about the humanity, things like empathy fall off the map. Things like creativity sometimes fall off the map because it's just easier to do what we've always done. But now, my friends, we're here in 2020. We're here in 2020, and what we have that connects us, what we have that connects us is a giant pandemic and our stories. Because the thing is, is that our stories or where connection lies. So let me share another quick story about myself. See, I'm, I'm born and raised in New York, Long Island, New York. Where are my New Yorkers at? Let me know in the chat. Born and raised in New York. I went to school in North Carolina. I went to UNC Wilmington. I went to Clemson for grad school for those of you playing at home. But I went to school in North Carolina. I'm at 12 hours away from home. I went to a state school in another state, which means everybody there knew somebody, and I was the only one that talked funny. <laughs> I remember my very first memory of college. I was like, you know, I could go to the dining hall, but it's like day two. I'm in a new environment, a new part of the country. I should try something, right? I should get out there. So I went to Wendy's because I respect culture. I went to Wendy's and I pulled up to the counter. I was like, yeah, how you doing? How you doing? Sure, cool, whatever. Yeah, listen, let me get a number two. No mustard, no one inch. Give me the large fry, large sweet tea, whatever that is, and give me a Frosty. And the woman looked me back dead in the eyes and she said, oh, I'm very sorry, sir, but all I got was hello. I was like, oh, geez, here we go. The thing is, is that the man that you see before you today, delightfully extroverted, wonderfully gregarious and charismatic, can go on. Maybe a little obnoxious. Maybe. Same guy that you see before you today. I showed up at college and I was absolutely miserable. I was miserable my first year of school because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody, and I didn't put myself out there. Despite being a classic extrovert, I still didn't put myself out there because whenever I saw people that I recognized from orientation, or I saw people that I recognized from my floor in the dining hall or something like that, I would always want to be like, oh, I should go put my food down next to them and have lunch with them. Or if I saw some people I recognized playing basketball, like, oh, shoot, let me see, we'll see if I could try to grab next. Or if I saw some folks that I recognized in the coffee shop on campus, I'd be like, oh, let me, let me put my laptop down next to them and let me, let me try to, uh, you know, get some work done. I recognized them from class. But then right before I did it, every single time, I was like, actually, James, don't do that, man. Just look at them. They're doing totally fine without you, bro. Listen, why don't you do yourself a favor, James? Because let's be honest, you're not cool enough. You're not funny enough. You're not smart enough. You're not hot enough. You're not trendy enough. You're not rich enough. You're not whatever enough. So why don't you just stay in your lane? And I told myself all these stories that kept me from joy. And isn't it just like us as human beings isn't it just like us as human beings to tell ourselves stories that keep us from joy? 
And so I did that. And so my first year was a pretty big struggle until I finally got involved. And for me, my involvement drug of choice was residence life. I became, I was in RHA, I was in RA as well. Um, and I also, uh, I also later on in my college career, I was in student government. I also joined uh, a fraternity. I'm a proud brother of Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. It's a D9 organization. If you know about that, then what's up? Um, but I didn't join, I, I wasn't happy until I finally got involved because all of a sudden I had a sense of purpose because academics weren't enough for me to fall in love with my school. See, I have a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology. I don't know if you've noticed just yet, but there's not one fish around me right now. <laughs> I currently use my degree to impress dates at aquariums. <laughs> it worked once, so I slapped a ring on it. Let's go, baby. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I asked her politely, and she said yes, and I'm very grateful. Great. Okay. But <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, is that academics were enough for me to fall in love with my school, but getting involved changed all that. And I assume that's one of the reasons why you are here on this call is because you have gotten involved. You know the value of becoming an owner in your college experience. Because we know that if you don't get involved on college, then you're just paying tuition. You're not actually using tuition, right? And so in getting involved, you became an owner in your experience. And that's beautiful. And that's beautiful. And so here we are in this beautiful moment and we got these cool ideas and these clubs and these organizations and these, flu and these floors and these communities, these chapters that we're excited to connect with and bond with and they really make the college experience just that, an experience. But then 2020 comes through and says, hold my beer. <laughs> and so now here we are. Here we are in this fascinating year in this fascinating year, and I want to talk about it with you because no one signed up for this, right? No one was like, you know what? I, I was thinking about running for president next year, but I think there's going to be a pandemic the year after that, and I think I really want the pandemic year. Is it cool? Is it cool if I wait for the pandemic year? Okay, great, thanks. Like, no, that, that didn't happen, right? Like, no one's like, oh, shit, yeah, pandemic year. Yeah, I'll take that. Cool, right? Like, that's not a thing that occurred, but here we are my friends. Here we are, my friends, and we got to play the hand that we were dealt because stagnation isn't going to work. As far as I'm concerned, this is my only life that I have, and so I need to smoke it while I got it. This is the only college experience that you have, and you need to smoke it while you got it, my friends. We need to keep it pushing, and so that's what I want to talk to you about today, and one of the things that we're going to do in order to talk about this because we're going to talk about authenticity. We're going to talk about authentic leadership. It's something that I'm super passionate about. And I believe that through authentic leadership, we are going to become better leaders here in 2020. We're going to create more opportunities and we're actually going to be able to see this as an opportunity and not just some dumb fluke that's going to be a bunch of great memes for the rest of time. So when we think about leaning into 2020 and authenticity, what I want you to think about um, is that there are a number of things that we need to do. And there are a number of things that make up a great authentic leader. And I'll talk about them today and apply them to 2020. Now, that means that there's going to be some moments when we think about authentic leadership, that's, that means leading from a really self-aware place. So there's going to be some moments in this conversation where we're going to get a little bit deeper. And I hope you'll come with me in some of those moments. Let's jump in. Let's jump in. So... Authentic leaders, first and foremost, lead with purpose. Purpose, big word, sounds cool, sounds sexy. What we're talking about when I say purpose is that as a leader, your intent will influence your impact. As a leader, your intent will influence your impact. In other words, the reason why you got involved in the first place, that's going to dictate what you actually do within your position. Perfect example of this. How many of you have ever worked alongside somebody who's only in their role because it's going to look good on their resume, right? Super, I see a lot of head nods for sure. You've worked with these individuals, right? They're only out here. They're only out here because of that bullet point on their resume. They're not out here to change the game, to advance. They're not really into it. They're just in it for the shine. We know these folks. 
because we know what they look like in our organizations. These are the kind of people that if you're a dues paying organization, they don't pay their dues. This is the kind of thing where if you're a service based organization, they're showing up to the service project, the philanthropy event, and they're out there and they show up right? They're rocking your, they're rocking your organization's shirt and they're showing up and then they're like, yo, hand me that paint roller really quick. I'm going to paint the side of this elementary school. And they grab the paint roll and they say, hey, can you do me a favor? Hold my phone really quick. Can you grab a boomerang in me? Right? And then they get it. Like, you ready? All right, cool. Let's go. All right, you get it? Oh yeah, hell yeah. That's dope. Hey, listen, y'all, I got to go, but you're doing really great work. Be well, right? They're only there for the shine. These are the individuals that love to sit in the back of your meetings and complain about what's going on, yet they never run for anything themselves. We know these folks. We know these folks because they're just in it for the shine. They're not in it for the work. They're not in it for the opportunity, the vision. Their purpose has already been fulfilled. The box has been checked. And now a lot of people are standing around being like, where's Mike? Does he even go here anymore? I haven't seen him. I thought he was our vice president. And so in this world, in this world, what I need you to recognize is that especially this year, especially this year, revisiting the purpose of your organization is incredibly important. And revisiting your purpose within the organization is equally as crucial because there's a lot of really frustrating aspects to leadership. When you signed up, when you signed up to be in this organization, you maybe didn't sign up for everything, right? You thought the engine was sexy, right? Oh, a lot of horsepower in this engine. Okay, I see what I see the output. There's a lot of opportunity. It sounds loud, sounds big, cool. But then you realize that there's a lot of grease and oil and annoying things that got involved to make the engine work. And in our organizations, that looks like committee meetings, that looks like extra staff meetings, that looks like holding people accountable, that looks like all of the damn emails ever. We didn't sign up to be the president of an organization because we couldn't wait to fill out 900 more emails a week. But those are all the grease that keep the engine moving. So revisit your purpose and allow it to serve as a bulldozer that pushes you through the frustrating aspects of leadership. And if you don't feel it anymore, then step down, my friends. Chances are your organization existed before you, and it will exist after you. And that's a cold, hard fact, my friends. But what you're also doing is you're giving yourself grace, and you're giving yourself time. And what a valuable gift to give yourself, time. The other way that I want to think about purpose this year is that I'm willing to bet that 95% of the organizations that are represented on this Zoom right now, your purpose can be fulfilled, albeit a little bit differently, even in the middle of a pandemic. Even in the middle, I know we have some schools on here that are completely remote for all of 2020. Some of you, if we got any Cal State schools out here, that you, you don't have spring either, right? And so, but the thing is, is that whether you are back on campus and socially distanced, or whether you are just back in the chapter house, or whether you're completely remote, whatever your situation is, the purpose of your organization can still be moved forward today. Think about it. If your organization was built to create belonging for certain individuals, you can still create belonging even now. Think about it. If your organization exists because you want to try to create home, a sense of home in a residence hall or at a campus, a sense of, of whatnot, you can create home today. You can give people the place where they can be seen. Your organization exists for professional development reasons, right? If you're in the biology club, you can still do that professional development even from afar. Yes, it sucks because we can't have pizza parties, but there's a chance we were all eating too much pizza. I'm just kidding. There's no such thing as too much pizza. But <laughs> the thing is, friends, is that I need you to dig down to the nugget of why your organization was created, of why it was founded, and how can you bring that to life? You're right. We can't do things the way we've always done them. But we all know that the death to all businesses is the phrase, well, that's the way we've always done it. And so we've been talking about the idea of change. 
We've been talking about the idea of trying to create and reinvent and reestablish. This is the time. This is the moment because you can't do things the way you've always done them. And we still have the opportunity to connect. And is it as joyous and as warming as being in person? Maybe not. But that doesn't mean we still can't move the needle. So dig back down through all of the, well, we can't do it that way, or I wish we could do this, or I wish we could do down into why were we started and how can we innovate from that nugget of where we started today? That's what we talk about when we say authentic leaders lead with purpose. Next thing we're going to talk about is the idea of empowerment. And empowerment is a really cliche word, but no one loves the word empowerment more than higher education institutions, right? Because here at the College of New Jersey, we empower our students. And I could have inserted any of your college's names in that thing because all of your brochures say the word empower in it about 473 times because the word's sexy, y'all, okay? Right, so, ooh, empower, go on. But the thing is, is that empowerment can't just be some cliche word. Empowerment goes back to the idea that leadership is more action and less title. Leadership is more action and less title. And so we think about this moment right now. And we think about this moment of, of, of how can we empower individuals. And here's a concept that I want you to think about. Leaders push, they don't pull. Leaders push, they don't pull, right? Let's take it for example. For example, if I can, I'm going to call out my friend. Let me, let me pick somebody here. Rebecca, is it cool if I tell everybody a story about you really quick? Rebecca, cool. I'm going to tell you a story. Thank you. I appreciate it, Rebecca. Uh, Y'all been sleeping on Rebecca. You don't know her, okay? Rebecca is a beast of an ice climber, okay? I'm talking like genetically manufactured great grandmother of the mountain is named after the woman right and so one day and one day rebecca decides hey i want to have an ice climbing program and the rest of us are like oh shoot an ice climbing program hell yeah i'm gonna be in the building or maybe outside the building but let's go she's our natural leader if she wanted she could shoot up the mountain the fastest if she wanted to because she's got all the skills she's got all the talents right she's our natural leader she's been there the most time she's got all the right equipment she's showing up with those spiky shoes the rest of us are showing up in Birkenstocks and socks like we didn't know what to expect <laughs> but it doesn't matter because Rebecca's got us now what she could do is shoot up the mountain the fastest and then just pull the rest of us up but that's not what leaders do. Leaders push, they don't pull. Because if all she does is pull us up to the top of the mountain, literally drag us up to the top of the mountain, then we're all going to get up there and be like, oh, wow. Yeah, this is really pretty. I don't really know how we got here. I didn't do anything, but it's pretty. So I guess as long as we're here, hashtag mountain, <laughs> with no sense of fulfillment. Meanwhile, if you're at the back of the pack, Rebecca, pushing, pushing individuals up the mountain, teaching them along the way, teaching them those skills, those tips, those tricks, all of those kinds of things so that they can actually do it without you next time. In this moment, you're teaching them along the way, oh, put your foot here, oh no, put your cramp on there, do this, do that. And we all climb the mountain together and we summon it in one foul swoop as a unit and we're like, oh shoot, I just did something. I was a part of the success of this mission, which is what every single member of your organizations and your communities wants to feel if they're in it for the right reasons. Think about it. If you can't tell me what part of the story of the success of your organization you helped write, then why would you continue to pour your energy into it? We can empower individuals right now to step up. We can look at the glass half empty if we would like. And it's very easy to look at the glass half empty here in 2020. And I've certainly had my days where like, yo, this year blows, okay? This is terrible. Um, and there's some parts where, I mean, I, I miss my family. I miss hugs. I miss so many things. And so, yeah, we could totally sit there and look at it as the glass half empty. There's also opportunity here. So we can also look at it as the glass half full, like we talked about earlier. What can we do differently? We've always wanted to change. How can we actually change now? Because we can't do the same stuff, right? But my friend Justin Jones Fosu likes to say this. He says, he says, James is not about glass half empty or the glass is half full. It's how do you fill the damn glass? And here in 2020, friends, how are you filling the glass? How are you seeing this? 
as a moment that doesn't have to suck. And when we talk about pushing versus pulling in your organizations, in your communities, a lot of times it feels like you're pulling. You're convincing people that this doesn't suck. You're telling them no, and it feels like you're guilt tripping individuals to show up and do things. That's not working. You're going to get exhausted. You're going to be burnt out by next week. But instead, how can we put some of the onus back on other individuals and put the idea of creativity and innovation onto others to get them dreaming and scheming with you? How can we push them to think, to dream, to act? That's how we take the load off of you. You were not elected to do everything, but you were elected to lead. And leading doesn't equal doing everything. That's not leadership. That's someone with trust issues and control issues. Let's be honest, right? So when we think about authentic leadership, we talk about this idea of being purposeful, of leading with purpose, finding that purpose, right? Your own internal one and your organizations. We talk about empowering others, this idea of push versus pull. How do we fill the damn glass? And the next thing that we're going to talk about is owning who you are. Because a lot of that stuff is external. And now I want to talk a little about some internal stuff. Let's get a little bit deeper. I hope that's cool with y'all. Let's get a little bit deeper right now. Owning who you are is the hardest thing we're going to talk about today. Because owning who you are involves putting every single facet of your life in front of a mirror. And I don't know about you all, but I personally find mirrors to be horrific places. Okay. <laughs> And I'm not just talking about putting your physical appearance in front of a mirror. No, I'm also talking about putting your choices in front of a mirror, putting your reputation, your relationships, your ego, your faith, if you have that, your friendships, all of these things in front of a mirror and truly seeing it. But that's hard because mirrors don't lie. And so when we think about owning who we are, some of you have heard me talk about this concept before. And I, I want to dive back into it because it's critical it's a process that's going to take most of our lives, but we can do it a little bit more consciously. We can do it a little bit more consciously, but there's some moments where it happens where we don't even recognize it. For example, I think uh, one of the moments that it happens the most is often when we're out late at night uh, with our friends that are your favorite late night eatery spot. And my friends, I don't know what your favorite late night eatery spot is, okay? I don't know if we, let me know in the chat. We got some Waffle House folks out here. We got some diner people out here. We got some in and out We got some Taco Bell run. We got some local spots, Steak and Shake. I don't know what your late, we got Taco Truck people out here. West Coast, I see you. Waffle House, Pancheros. I've been to Pancheros. It is good. Um, sheets, Wawa, right? Wawa Sheets Battle. I see you, Pennsylvania. Cookout, any place that I can get a quesadilla as a free side is a great restaurant. Whataburger, I see you, Texas. Uh, Zaxby's, give me that Zax sauce. Shake Shack, are they open late? Doesn't matter, it's delicious. Uh, Culver's, absolutely, I love it. Your favorite late night eatery spot, my friends, this is the spot where you roll out to with your friends and you all look like a hot mess, right? Like, like the makeup you put on gave up hours ago. Whatever product you put in your hair is like, I'm actually done, thank you, right? Like <laughs> you're rolling out, your hat's askew, your socks don't match, but it doesn't matter because you're with people that you love. You're with people that you love. And so I love these moments. Me and my friends, we go out to Applebee's for half-price appetizers because we got it like that. Oh, um, so we go out to half price appetizers at Applebee's and uh, well, it's, it's the neighborhood restaurant after all. Come on. Um, but uh, some of you are shaking your head. I'll take that. <laughs> so, uh, and I love it because one of my friends will always start the conversation with something like a, yo, bro, you'll never believe what happened to me last week. You'll never believe what happened to me last week. And you'll start to jump in to an, in, you'll start to jump in to an embarrassing story. They'll jump into an embarrassing story. And my friends, what we don't recognize, though, is that when we share embarrassing stories about ourselves, it actually helps us own a little bit of who we are. So here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. In the chat, in the chat, I want you to, and I'll share an embarrassing story with you, my friends. I'm not going to leave you high and dry. In the chat, I want you to, in five words or less, tell me about an embarrassing story about yourself. For example, Sent pick to wrong person. <laughs> For example, uh, put foot in mouth in front of rabbi. Um, right? I don't know if that was five words, but 
like fell up the stairs, dropped, spilled something everywhere. Uh, let's see what we got here. I see you also McDonald's. Yep. Give me that extra hot fudge in that Sunday, please. Screen door was still closed. Yes, Kelsey. Stuck in the spaghetti pot. Liv, I want pictures. Cried at dropping cinnamon bun delights. Rebecca, listen, I told you this was the deep part of the program, my friends. I'm going to cry with you. Uh, Zoom mic on in class. Oh, no. <laughs> Fell up the stairs, spilled coffee. Spilled salad down the stairs. That's awkward. Those tomatoes get slippery. Sprained ankle, walking my cat. I feel like there's two embarrassing things in there, Amy. <laughs> Not on mute. Spilled water in parm um, in parmesan cheese on the first date. That's terrible. Uh, said something wrong to the wrong person. Hit by a golf cart. Oh man, that's incredible. Text to the wrong person. <laughs> Flirted with Phoenix and Ferb quotes. That's awesome. Uh, don't honk while rollerblading. I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> happy birthday. You too, Alyssa. Well played, my friend. I've definitely been there. Another you too moment. That's a Brian Regan jokes in there. Uh, car crash going two miles an hour. Yep, absolutely. I have been in a driveway and decided to put the car into drive and not into reverse and just smacked into my friend's car. That was cool. That was really fun. Uh, microwaved Easy Mac without water. I bet that was atrocious. Uh, I love this. <clears throat> Actually sent this private. Josh, awesome. <laughs> Friends, we all have embarrassing stories. It's fun when we share them. I'll share one with you about myself right now. At my senior prom, I dislocated my right knee dancing to Shania Twain's Man, I Feel Like a Woman. That happened, y'all. That happened. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, it actually happened during dinner. See, I don't know who the DJ was at my senior prom, but dude was dropping straight fire all night. And normally during formal events like that, they'll drop it down and play like some smooth jazz or some Billy Joel during dinner. But no, my man just kept coming with the bangers. And so me and my friends were like, yo, if he's going to keep the dance floor hot, we got to make sure it doesn't get too chilly. And so we went out there and had a good time, y'all. I was dancing around, hopping around. Man, I feel like a woman comes on. And when that song comes on, you got two choices in life. You either go hard or you go home. I may have went a little bit too hard. I was jumping around. I jumped onto my right leg. My knee blew out. I fell to the ground, had to pop my own knee back in. I then proceeded to drag myself to the side of the dance floor. My principal rushed over and handed me three ice cubes. To this day, I don't know if those are for my glass of water or my inflammation, but either way, very sweet. <laughs> my friends dragged me over. They sat me down. They propped up the leg. They handed me some chicken parmesan. So I cried into some chicken parmesan. Some of you all call those Tuesdays. So we all have embarrassing stories. It's fun when we share them, friends. But I want you to think about this. When we share our embarrassing stories, whether we recognize it or not, they are reminding us that we are resilient. And you have to remember that you're resilient. If you don't believe that you are resilient, then the next time you're faced with something hard, uncomfortable, something you're unsure about, you don't know about, you'll be less likely to try. You'll be less likely to start. You'll be less likely to love. My friends, today in this moment, you got to put a snippet of your embarrassing story to a whole bunch of strangers and laugh about it because you're fine, <laughs> even if it just happened. Even in that moment, you wish you could have been somebody else, right? And it was horrific and it was painful and it was embarrassing. But today, you got to tell the story because you're fine. We must remember that we are resilient. And as a leader in 2020, you have to remember this. It is critical because you're going to try a whole bunch of stuff. Last year, you could try things and it was pretty safe because maybe it had already been done or you kind of knew what was going on or whatnot, or you, or you assumed people would show up because at least there was free food. This year, you've got to try We've got to put ourselves out there. We've got to recognize that we need to show up to the baseball park if we're ever going to hit the ball. Don't take yourself out of the game before you've even let your chance, given yourself a chance to play it.
We have the capacity to bounce back. And when we share these embarrassing stories, it reminds us just that. It reminds us just that. It helps us own who we are. It helps us own who we are. But I'm that friend during these late night conversations that loves to switch it up and have a deep conversation. I don't know where, where some of y'all, where my deep conversation starters in the room. Here's what a deep conversation often starts, uh, a, a deep conversation starter often sounds like. That's the person when everybody's sharing embarrassing stories, everybody's going, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so fun. We're having so much fun. I know. How do you define happiness? Right? It's that folk. It's that individual with the mozzarella sticks hanging halfway out your mouth and everybody's laughing. And you're like, oh, that's me, friends. I got a question that I want to ask you that goes a little bit deeper into the idea of owning who you are. What's one lie that you tell yourself every single day? And I want you to think about it. I'm just supposed to joke in the chat right now. I want you to think about it. I'm not talking about, oh, I'm going to work out. I'm not talking about, I'm not going to text her. I'm not going to text him. I'm not going to text them. I'm not talk I got some of y'all with that. I know I got some of y'all with that. I'm not talking about, I'm not about to finish this whole sleeve of cookies. No, my friends, finish the cookies. Tomorrow is a new day. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the deeper lies. Yes, my friends who are talking about like, where are my people out there that say the phrase, I'm fine, right, Ebony? I'm fine, I'm fine. Head is actively on fire. <laughs> no, I'm fine. It's Head's on fire Tuesday. You didn't get the memo, Gretchen, right? <clears throat> Absolutely, we know these things. We see ourselves putting them, this beautiful vulnerability in the chat right now. I love it. My friends, we tell ourselves little lies. We tell ourselves a little lie. For example, I knew this was a casual affair, right? I didn't tell you all to come dressed up business casual, but I still needed to look cute today because in my twisted brain, in my twisted brain, if I didn't look cute, I think you'd be more focused on how unattractive I am than on my message because I have a low self-esteem about my physical appearance. And so I needed to put this little button up all the way to the top of here because I needed to focus more on my message than on my freshness, even though I know you would have deep down probably already would have done that. But today I needed to win. Every single day when we wake up, we need to win. And so if we need to lie to ourselves a little bit that day to get through the day, my friends, I think that's okay. I think that's called being a human being and we're allowed to be one of those. But we all know the phrase, fake it till you make it. But if all you ever do is fake it, you never really make it. And so we have to start owning these lies. I need you to start owning these lies. I need you to start realizing these stories that you tell yourself. These stories that we tell ourselves, like I'm just being dramatic. I'm fine. I'm tired. It's all good. I'm not overworked. I don't need help, right? Today was okay. Everything is okay. I'm unlovable. My friends, these are stories that you have written about yourself and that's it. And I need us to start to own these stories. As you heard, I did it myself as well. I still do it myself, right? I frequently think, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not cool enough. I'm not funny enough. I don't have enough followers. I'm not trendy enough. I'm not driving the cool thing. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm hip. I'm getting too old. I'm this and that. I tell myself all of these stories that keep me exactly where I am that keep me frozen, that keep me from showing up for individuals the way I could, but more importantly, keep me from showing up for myself. I often tell people I'm a pharmacist, right? I pass out the drugs. No, you should take care of yourself. Practice self-care. You're beautiful. Handle this. Do that. No, follow your dreams. But when it comes to myself, I'm like, no, nah, I, I, mean, I, I don't personally touch this stuff, right? Oh, self-care? No, no, that, you should do that. You do that. I'm good over here. <laughs> the stories that you're telling yourselves, every single one of them, not a, no one else knows about. No one knows about your finances. No one knows about your mental health, your physical health. No one knows about your academics. No one knows what it's like to be you and walk around in your body on this earth. But every single one of these lies, these stories, are different bricks that you carry. And you owe it to yourself to live a lighter life. You owe it to yourself to live a lighter life. 
I don't know what owning your lies looks like. For me, sometimes it looks like me driving inappropriate speeds down the highway with my windows down, blasting, blasting panic at the disco, and openly weeping, okay? Don't act like you don't have a crying song, okay? So the thing is, is that I sometimes do that. Also, sometimes what owning my lies looks like, looks like me sitting in a small room with a woman across from me who looks like a counselor named Sarah. Because it's me sitting in the room with my counselor named Sarah. <laughs> because sometimes I need to talk about, I need to talk to somebody. I need to stop being the hero and I need to just start showing up for me. I need to start showing up for others and I need to talk about it first. Because we have to own who we are so we can be real to other folks. We have to own who we are so we can become real to other people. But being real is fascinating in the 2020 age. Being real is fascinating right now. Because you can be whoever you want online. You can be whoever you want online right? <laughs> I have some friends of mine. I currently live in Minnesota. I currently live in Minnesota. We just bought a house over here, getting that grown man status. Um, but we live in Minnesota and I have friends of mine that live here in Minnesota with me that love to post pictures of themselves standing next to palm trees for nine months out of the year. My friends don't know if you've made it to Minnesota recently, but it turns out it's where palm trees go to die. Right? There's like one palm tree up here and it's hopping around being like, where's my family? It's very sad. <laughs> so the thing is, the thing is that you can be whoever you want online. And I tell those friends, I'm like, yo, you went to Miami like 14 months ago. It's time to start posting your pasty pictures like the rest of us. You can be whoever you want online, but you can also be whoever you want when you step in front of that community that you lead. You can be whoever you want in front of your chapter, in front of your floor, in front of your organization. You can be whoever you want. And so my question to you after what's one lie that you tell yourself every single day is what version of yourself do you allow others to see? What version of yourself do you allow others to see? I, I want you to think about this. Because no one chose 2020. No one chose it. And so right now, you're faced with having to be a leader in a brand new climate that there's no books on, right? You can't be like, well, let's pull out the old pandemic book and see what they did back in 1934, right? Like, no, that's not a thing. So in this moment, in this moment, you have to choose to lead. And you have to recognize that you are the right person. How do we lead through uncertainty? We keep it moving. We don't allow the murkiness of the swamp to stop us from walking through it, my friends. You were elected, selected, hired. You were all of those things, not because you were the most perfect, but because you were the most trusted. And there's a big difference. The pressure that you are putting on yourself to be the perfect leader that your organization needs in this unfathomable time is not fair, is not kind. And every one of us deserves kind, kindness and grace, even from ourselves. And so when we think about leading through uncertainty, my friends, it happens by doing it with authentic leadership. It happens by leading from exactly where we are. Your peers trusted you. And that doesn't mean they trusted you to get everything right. That doesn't mean they trusted you to do everything and cover their ass. That doesn't mean they trusted you to beat yourself up at night and work crazy long hours and worry and do all of those kind of things. No, they trusted you to show up. They trusted you to show up and ask for help when you need it. And you probably need it. I know I need it. That's why I see a counselor, <laughs> right? That's why I lean on my partner as well. And she's got my back when I don't have my own. So right now, when we think about leading through uncertainty, a lot of that looks like vulnerability. Vulnerability is a scary word, y'all. Vulnerability is scary because 
like um, so often people associate vulnerability with weakness, but if vulnerability is such a weakness, then why is this so damn hard? Let's be honest real quick. It is easier to not ask for help than it is to ask for help. It is easier to compartmentalize and avoid than it is to own and confront. Vulnerability takes courage and leaders are courageous. My friends, you are resilient. You are courageous. You are the person for the job right now. Stop taking yourself out of the game before you give a chance to play it. Because right now, our people need us. And yes, the pandemic, but also the extremely important social justice movement that is happening in our country right now, my friends. And many of you have people on your campus that are out here saying Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. A lot of people are out here saying All Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. And the fact of the matter is, my friends, is that they're both right, technically. They're both right. But if I'm looking at a row of houses and one of them is on fire, I'm not sending the fire truck to every single house on the block. I'm sending it to where we need it. I'm sending it to where the fire needs to get put out. And right now, because of decades and centuries of individuals not being heard, seen, felt, listened to, respected, the house is on fire. And it is okay for us to help individuals when they need help. It is okay for us to put our own stuff down and pick somebody else's stuff up so that we can lift each other up, my friends. This is the moment where we must listen to each other. We don't do enough listening. And leadership sounds like action, but often looks like listening. And so when we think about this moment right now, when we think about this moment right now, as uncomfortable as it is, as, as it is also equally, if not more so, important. And what I want you to know is that as leaders, I need you to be more interested in what is right than being right. As leaders, I, know you, I need you to be more interested in what is right than being right. And so when we think about this moment, leading with authenticity, leading with vulnerability through uncertainty, learning how to be right involves reaching out to others, listening to stories, connecting, and growing together, holding hands while we walk through the ambiguity and the nonsense and the murkiness that is the swamp that is 2020. You're taking yourself out of the game because you don't think you know what to do right now, but you do because you know how to listen and you know how to love. And so I know you know how to lead. That's it. That's how we keep it pushing here in 2020, my friends. And I'm excited that you are in the roles that you are in because you deserve to be there. As much as that little annoying voice on your right shoulder tells you you're not, that voice is a liar. Those are the stories that you don't need to listen to. But it's okay that they're there because you're a human being. My friends, it has been so special getting to hang out with you today. It has been incredible. I cannot thank you for coming through and showing up for yourself, for your communities. I welcome you to stay in touch with me. I want you to stay in touch with me if you are interested. If you are interested in me uh, potentially helping out your communities, I've been doing a ton of virtual speaking for all sorts of different individuals. And here is how you can do that. I just threw it in the chat. That's my website. That's my email. We'll also shoot you an email with this recording as well next week with a little bit more information for how to get in touch with me. If you want to hook up on social media, hook up is an inappropriate word choice there. That's unfortunate. We all have regrets. So if if you want to connect on social media, that's my IG. I've been posting some meaningful stuff. I also have, I also have a uh, podcast that's coming out in a couple of weeks. It's called Diner Talks with James, um, and it's about those deep conversations that we have late at night uh, that are often vulnerable but also hysterical. So if you want to hear more about that, I'm going to tell you about that. Um, but friends, these are places for you to connect with me. It has been such a pleasure 
to get to spend this time with you. I'm going to hang out um, and, and offer, if there's questions and stuff like that, feel free to put those questions in the chat. I'll hang out, answer some of those questions for sure. But let me end on a quote because that's what professional speakers are carefully paid to do. And that's what I get paid to do is being a professional speaker. And so let me do this. I'll end on a quote. One of my favorite quotes of all time. One of my favorite quotes of all time is from a rapper named Shad. And Shad simply says this. He says, well, I can't be everything to everyone, so let me be anything to anyone. Shad said, well, you can't be everything to everyone. I can't be, I can't be everything to everyone, so let me be anything to anyone. My friends, I need you to lead from exactly who you are right now. Do you have it all together? No. Do you have all the answers? No. Are you the perfect leader? No. But are you the right leader right now for your organizations? Yes. Can you be something to someone? Yes. Jump in. Get in the game. Let's put in work, my friends. It's been so dope hanging out with you all. You take care.